uh, hopefully you find today's topic as interesting as I do. Love talking about career development. And that's what we're talking about today. We're actually only going to cover one chapter today. Look at that. <laughs> um, because I think this is important. So I'm going to try to take my time. So there's five criteria for success. Number one, peace of mind, which I think is important as number one because I'm finding that without it, everything else just kind of falls apart, which leads to the second one. You got to be healthy, so health and energy. Number three, a loving relationship. And number four, freedom from financial hardship. And number five, a perception of personal fulfillment. So when we're thinking in terms of success and being successful, you need to make sure that you are able to check off all five of these things. They're important. So obviously, if we want to be successful, we want to grow, we want to develop in our careers, we probably need to be an achiever. So what's an achiever? Here are some characteristics. They project a winning attitude. Have you ever been around someone who is just OK with losing? They don't see anything wrong with it. And if you think about that person or those types of people, also ask yourself, how successful are they? Um, so you want to try to always have a winning attitude. Not saying you have to be overly competitive to the point where it's annoying, but you do want to have that winning spirit. You also want to be enthusiastic about your work. Being enthusiastic about your work is obviously going to help you achieve things um, because you want to be there. If you're somewhere where you're not enthusiastic about the things you're doing, more than likely you're not going to be that successful. You have to be flexible and able to deal with change. And in healthcare, this is going to be very important because as we know, things are always changing you know, from day to day, from week to week, from year to year. So you have to be able to be flexible. What about uncertainty, right? Achievers, you gotta be able to accept it. Again, in healthcare, there will be a lot of unknowns. You know, even if we think about in terms of patients, there's gonna be some patients that do well and be discharged, and then there's gonna be some patients where we don't know what's gonna happen. So whether we're dealing in terms of patients, staffing, um, or the viability of the company, we have to be able to accept that there's going to be some things we don't exactly know what's going to happen. And last thing, achievers are quick learners. It helps to be able to pick things up quickly rather than having to have someone explain it to you five or six times. Um, so being able to learn quickly and pick things up is also going to help you be an achiever. We're talking about career development today. Here are a few more. They hold themselves accountable. I always think that when you hold yourself accountable, you tend to have a higher standard than when you know, someone else is holding you accountable or no one's holding you accountable at all. So accountability is key. You manage your own empowerment and morale. Sure, we are going to look to our managers to try to empower us, but you also have to have a sense of internal empowerment, personal empowerment as well. Achievers are problem solvers and not complainers. When you're complaining, you're doing what? You're wasting time. Mm -hmm. So again, if we're thinking in terms of an achiever, this is a person who's successful, who's getting things done, they don't have time to complain. They just get it done. Um, which goes along with them using their time wisely. And they set goals for themselves. Again, you know, you're going to have your annual meeting with your boss where you'll have goals set up. But I always found it helpful to also have my own personal goals aside from those that I may want to hold myself accountable to to meet in addition to or in tangent with the goals that my manager has set up for me. And if, you know, I don't meet them, that's okay. But at least I've, you know, created a plan or a goal to try to meet. If I don't meet it, I'll try to meet it, you know, the next year, the next month. Here are a few more. They're innovative. Always thinking of creative ways to do things or always thinking of new ways to do things or, or ways to fix problems, right? Um, 
And to do that, you gotta have a certain level of proficiency. So they're typically technical and professionally competent, which means they're going to be the ones that are leading the departments, leading the organizations. They're gonna be the ones that know about the changing trends that are happening. You're gonna be that go-to person if you're an achiever. Uh, achievers are assertive, but also stress resistant. What does this mean? This means that they know when to step up, they know when to take charge, but at the same time, they're not gonna cause any drama. Um, and it takes a spe special skill to be able to be assertive while not causing drama. A lot of people don't necessarily understand the difference between the two. Um, achievers are effective communicators. Well, that's obvious, and again, that's another reason why I try to have you all do projects where you have to speak because achievers do have to be able to effectively communicate to people, whether it be on paper or verbally or email or whatever, whatever you may have. Um, and achievers are customer oriented. And of course, with us being in healthcare, we gotta be customer oriented. We're gonna be dealing with patients probably almost every day. So, while we may be great achievers, we have to also understand that there may be some risks that go along with being an achiever, right? Um, so, when we think in terms of taking risks, there's some things that we have to consider first. Well, number one, what's my goal? What's my objective, right? Um, it's important to know what the goal is before we take the risk because we want to make sure it's worth it, right? What are the, the best and worst outcomes? We want to make sure that we've evaluated all the different outcomes, again, to make sure that it's worth taking this major risk. What more information might we need to support our decision? And from what sources is important because if you're getting this information from sources that aren't reliable, it may affect your decision, and if you take the major risk when you shouldn't have, you may encounter some trouble. And what are the alternatives? We have to always think about alternatives, obviously, when we're taking major risks, because again, we wanna make sure that we're making the right decision. Now, we've thought about the risks, but we should probably also think about the rewards that occur when we're thinking about taking a major risk, right? And what barriers, we may have to overcome, that may mean a barrier, maybe a colleague, it may be our boss, it may be our staff, it could be any of those or anything else, but we have to consider them. Um, we have to look at what support may be available. Maybe we have a mentor, an organization that we can go to to help, that's gonna be a good resource for us for support. What contingency plan do we have? Do we have a plan B, plan C? If things go wrong or things don't go as planned, we probably should have one. How can I eliminate the risk? Well, you may not be able to eliminate the risk, but we should still think about if we can. It's gonna depend on the actual situation and the issue as to if the, the risk can be reduced or not. And how might delay affect this? A lot of times in healthcare, things are prioritized, which means that some things get pushed off or delayed to handle other important things. So we have to think about how that might affect, affect the risk as well. So along with risk, we obviously also will have opportunities. So if you're working in your job and you're happy where you are, do you think you should still be looking at opportunities? Yeah. Why so? Because you need to move on. You don't want to stay in the same place and keep doing the same thing. You're going to get bored. Plus, you need to be better. But what if you're really, you really happy where you are? You love your job. You love your staff. You feel like you're growing where you are. Are we still looking for opportunities? Well, that mm -hmm. depends on the person. Though. So it depends on the person. Yeah. You say yes. I say yes. You say yes. Changes, career. Here's the thing. You may be happy where you are now, but depending on what the opportunity is, who knows when the opportunity will come around again. Mm -hmm. For instance, if um, you know, the opportunity comes that the position above you is open, well, you may say that you're happy where you are and you're in 
enjoying your position? Well, what if this is a, a position that people tend to stay in for a long time once they get there? So if you pass up that opportunity, it may not come around again while you're there, right? So it is always good to evaluate um, possible opportunities in your workplace. You should be looking at um, possible promotions. Maybe there's a lateral move that you want to make, which basically means you may not be moving up, but you may be moving to a different um, area that's equivalent to where you are now. Those can also be good because uh, you're allowing yourself to diversify more and learn more about different things. So you want to not only look at, always look at promotions up, but also maybe good lateral moves that may be good for you also. You also want to be alert to outside opportunities as well. Um, sometimes I, you know, have conversations with friends and colleagues and, you know, we bounce different ideas off of each other. And in the past, the conversation has come up as to if once you get a job, should you turn off all of those alerts that you had on while you were searching for jobs? What do you guys think? No. Anybody else? Have a no over here? Mm -hmm. Have a no over here? No. No? I, I, I agree with you guys. I think that you should be alert of outside opportunities. Number one, because you never know, again, you never know what may come along and while, you know, we are not gonna get a job and then just quickly jump into another job. But it's always good to have a pulse on the market to see what's out there, to see what people are hiring people for salary-wise. That meant The more you know about what's going on on the outside will help you become more of an achiever and more competitive within your own marketplace because you'll know what to ask for. Not only that is, if you're like me, I like to help people. So sure, I might have a job, but I'm gonna keep the alerts on because I may have a friend that's looking and I may be able to pass this information on to them. That's how things happen. You help people, people help you. So um, try to always be alert of outside opportunities, um, even if you're happy where you are, even if you already have a job. You wanna keep your pulse on what's going on in, in the um, outside marketplace. So thinking in terms of Again, us being in our organization, us being happy, you still want to continue to work on your marketability. Does everybody know what marketability is? Updating your resume and also just being knowledgeable about your job and what you do and being knowledgeable in terms of being able to speak to yourself as what type of candidate you are. Um, something that I've heard many times over the years is that you should always have your elevator speech ready. Does everybody know what your elevator speech is? Elevator speech is basically an elevator speech. So if you are to get into an elevator with someone, more than likely you're not gonna be on the elevator that long with people, right? So you should be able to have a speech about yourself that's short and quick, but to the point, enough that if a CEO walks in the elevator with you, you can market yourself in that short amount of time. And so, being able to market yourself, I want, I'm challenging all of you guys to work on your elevator speech. So an elevator speech for you guys might go something like, hi, my name is Jennifer, I'm in the h and program, I'm hoping to get a job at XYZ once I graduate. Oh, that's what I did last week with this guy at the hospital. You should always he, be able to just think, of, works think about it just he like said, that. Dean, I think it's, I forgot his name, but I can't tell you anything else because he was there, but I met him and he was asking me about the school and everything. Yeah, that should be something that you shouldn't have to stumble over. It should be something quick, automatic, but again, powerful enough to be able to convince somebody that by the time they walk off the elevator, they say, hmm, she was pretty sharp, right? And so that kind of goes along with marketability, being able to market yourself, being knowledgeable, being versatile, and, not, and being able to show that. Some people are smart, but can't show it. Some people have great skills, but don't know how to market it. So you wanna not only have the skills, but be able to show somebody, be able to convince them of it. How do you get there? These are some questions you can ask yourself. If my services suddenly became unavailable, how will my responsibilities be discharged? What that basically means is, can they run the show without me, 
right? You could also ask yourself, how long would it take them to find me, me a replacement? Again, if you're really, really good at something, it might take them a while to find someone or be able to train someone to do the things that you do. Now, the longer this takes and the, the more time it takes to train somebody, the better you are, right? If it takes somebody a day to train someone else to do what you do, you're probably not that important, right? Now, if it's gonna take them a month, then they're more than likely gonna try to keep you, right? Um, who's on board and who can take over? Again, if there's no one that currently works there that can take over quickly, again, that's a, an advantage for you. And what have I done to prepare a successor? Now this one is important because a lot of times we think about ourselves, we think about our growth and our development. But here's the thing, do you think that, or what is, what is the likelihood do you think that you'll get promoted if you haven't done this, if you have not thought about who might be able to take over my position? They're not gonna promote you, right? You need a continuity book or something like that to keep something going. Because if you haven't thought about this, they have no, no initiative to pull you out of that position if they have no one else to put there. So while you're growing, and this is important to remember, as you're growing, as you're developing, setting up your own goals to be promoted, to move up out of your position, make sure that you have plans for someone else so that can, it can be an easy transition. While you move up, someone else moves into your position and they can take over and do all the things that you can do so that no one's upset here. Uh, meaning your boss is not upset. So this was very important because I, I personally, in my experiences, have seen that this is not always done. Um, and I think it's important for managers to remember other people and help them grow and develop them as they're doing themselves so that it will increase your likelihood of being promoted. So if we think about where you are right now, and I know some of you all aren't working, so you don't have to carry these questions a little bit. But let's just, in our mindsets for the purposes of this class, think about that we all have a job, right? We're just gonna think in terms that we all have a job. And if that was the case, you always wanna review where you are from time to time. You wanna review your present status. So these are the questions you might ask. Am I doing what I want to do? I'm going to pick on you because you love to talk about your job anyway. <laughs> so, are you doing what you want to do right now? No. No, all right, we'll stop right there. <laughs> 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 Red flag. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, so this is going to be good. So you're not doing what you want to do, all right? Do you spend most of the day doing things you enjoy? At yeah. work, at work. Uh, work? Yes. <laughs> it's okay to me, though. So it's okay. All right. Okay. Are there any things about your present situation that you're reluctant to change? In terms of work? Um, my position, I guess. I don't so your be, position? Yeah, I don't want to be work. I don't want to be there forever. So you do want to change. Is there anything about your job that you don't want to change right now? Like... Yeah, like, I don't want to be doing whatever I'm doing now, you know, like, in, in, right now, that's the thing I want to change, but I cannot do it till, like, six months or a year from now. Okay. So I just Because of school, right? So your reluctance to change might be school Plus related. school, and I have to wait there, too. All right. Six months for me to change my position or to look for something else. Okay. Are there any changes where you work right now that might decrease the amount of time that you spend doing no. what you dislike doing. No. All right. And then the last question, kind of important. Do you think that you want to move in the direction of a generalist or a specialist? Does everybody know the difference? No. No. You don't know the difference or no? I don't know. I don't know what it is. All right. Anybody know the difference? Can I tell me the difference? General just doing whatever and the specialist is going more in depth into it. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, about halfway there. Okay. A specialist would be an example of 
a neonatal nurse manager. Something very specific. A generalist is someone who knows a little bit about a lot of different things. That's what I want to be. So if we think in terms of healthcare management jobs, a specialist might be someone like a coder. Coding is all they do. Oh, no. A generalist might be someone like an office manager. If you're an office manager, you have to know you have to know about the billing and coding. You have to know how to manage people. You have to know about um, payroll. That's what I want. To so do. you have so a generalist is somebody that knows a, more like a little bit about a Jack lot of all trades kind of thing. Whereas a specialist is going to be someone that particularly deals with specifically okay. one area, and this is important to decide early on in your career because it's going to determine what type of jobs you apply for. If you know that you want to be a coder or a, or a specialist right on, then, then you can decide, okay, what type of specialist do I want to be? Do I want to be a coder? Do I want to be a claim specialist, et cetera, et cetera? If you decide early on you want to be a generalist, then you can start looking at what types of positions that might entail. Maybe you want to be a consultant. You have to know a little bit about everything. Maybe you want to be a manager or an office, whatever it may be. The take home here is that it's important to decide early on because if you don't, then you start trying to switch careers midway through and sometimes you have to go back and start at the bottom and move your way back up. So the earlier you can decide this, the better. Sure, you may not know and that's okay, um, but as long as you know that this is something that you need to decide, eventually that's important so I asked you all those questions and I'm going to ask the rest of the class based on the answers that we got from her how do you feel about her present status she needs to find another job, <laughs> she needs to find another job. She's unhappy. it's not even that She's the thing unhappy. is that like she says like me before I, I want to move, I need to be in that position where I'm at, but I don't want to be there forever, you know? I want to keep moving, but I also want to learn whatever is around me, so when I move, I know what, how to deal with, you know, with those, with, you know, with those people, whatever. That's the way I think, like, I don't care, you know, I do my job, and, you know, I will learn everything, but I just want to keep moving, I don't want to be, be there for two, three years like I see other people, hopefully not. But you know, I just want to keep moving and moving and learning new things. And That's my point. I will say this, I, I picked on her, but she's at, at a point where she's just starting her healthcare career. And so when you first start, you may not initially start yeah. doing something that you love. That's just the reality of it. You may have to take something that you're just okay with to kind of get your foot in the door so that you can move up. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't want to jade you guys into thinking that you should be going for that first job that you're going to love, because it may not happen, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. you know, considering mm -hmm. the job market we have right now. And more if you don't have experience, it's going to be right. so hard. And if you don't have experience, it's going to be like difficult. school, sometimes I look at school like, uh, it's okay, but what's your experience, you know? So if you have experience, that's good. Now what I am saying is, you don't want to be in the same predicament years from now. There should no. be some change in your answers. Okay. Any other comments about this? Because this is important. Here are a few other questions. Maybe you need to switch from full-time to part-time if you're not happy. Um, is the work that you're doing congruent with what you believe? I find sometimes that one of the reasons people aren't happy in their jobs is because their internal or personal values don't match that of the organization. Um, or maybe the career is hurting their personal family um, life. To reach new goals, what must I sacrifice? Sacrifice is important because at some point in your career you will have to make a sacrifice. Whether it be in the beginning, in the middle, at the end. If you're aiming to move up or if you're aiming to be an achiever, sacrifice is going to happen. Um, you have to think about your family members and how they feel about changes that you may be making. Um, even if 
it, sometimes it's hard because you're working to move up, you're working to be successful, and your family members may not always agree with you. So this is definitely something you have to think about when you're reviewing your status. If you're unhappy again, do you look for a different job within the organization or outside? And this will depend a lot on the organization itself, how you feel about it. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Like, I, I don't know, um, Michelle might be able to uh, think about this too. When we got out of the military, we had to do a resume to transition out of the military to a civilian. Now, with that, we had to change everything from military lingo to civilian lingo. Now, with that, because a lot of it that I've learned, I can use in the healthcare industry. So could I change some of that to healthcare lingo, like the business part of it? Yeah, I mean, I, you're talking in terms of resume. Right. Yeah, it, doesn't, it never hurts to have more than one resume. Okay. So sure, if you want to create a healthcare resume and cater it to healthcare. Yeah. Because I, I know I have a, like a business resume, but I know I might be able to change some of that to healthcare. Yeah. Okay. Oh. And, and it may get even um, more specific than that. If you're applying to a specific job within healthcare, you may even want to tweak it again if it's a specific area like billing or marketing or whatever it may be within healthcare. There's certain words that you use in different um, areas. So okay. you can always, you know, tweak your resume to kind of care whatever particular job you're applying to. Or, so okay. I have several different resumes. Okay. And, and some of the changes are tr uh, just minimal changes, but it's enough. It was enough for me to decide to just create a new resume or really just copy and change some stuff. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, I love my job. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I don't like. The thing is that we haven't We've been working everywhere. We haven't been at whole county. Like, it's not, you know, we've been at the ED. You know, we've been everywhere in the place and you get tired of it. And you've been working with different people and those people tell you, this is what you're supposed to do. And then you have to follow different, you know, there are people that are not even your boss or your supervisor telling you what to do. That's the thing that's get you right there. Yeah, but change my, like, everything. I, us, we don't even know when we're going to Hope County. And for us, you know, they're just trying to keep us working and, you know, so they just make us to work at the EV. But that's the thing that I don't like working at the EV. I just want to go to Hope County and do our stuff out there so we can, you know. ED, ED works good experience, though. I know. So just be happy for that experience. I know. And at L and D, we've been at L and D. Um, EB, Heidsmith, HPN, and I'm going back next week to a Heidsmith. <laughs> yeah, so that's crazy. Just in Hope County, I live in Hope County and drive all the way there. But it's okay. But you have a job. Yeah, I know. That's the thing I look at. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Like, you have a job. Wait a minute, you that's have a job. I, that's the thing I keep looking at and I keep saying experience, experience, experience. And that's why it keeps me going. All right, networking. Very, very, very important. Let's talk about networking. How you guys feel about networking? Mm. <laughs> um, it's, it's hard. It's, it's not hard. easy. It is very Especially hard. if you're an introvert. It's, it is difficult if you're an introvert. It's very difficult. Here's the thing. You have to think of it as acting or something because it's so important. I don't know the numbers, but I think it's 70%, 80% of, job, of jobs are obtained through networking, not applying online, not applications. So it's very important to network. I can't express to you how important it is. Um, that's how, you know, it's all about who you know. Sure, I want you guys to be great students, great writers, great communicators, have great skills. But I want you to be great networkers because that's where the magic happens. Um, probably more than half of the jobs I've had have been because I knew somebody that knew somebody, not because I was able to express how great I am on my resume. So let's go back to this issue because 
it's important about being shy and being introverted. So how do you network? It's difficult. Um, networking hasn't always come easy for me. I found that when I started out, I would try to go, some, go somewhere with someone else. Uh, meaning if it was a meeting or something, I'd ask some of my friends, you wanna go to this meeting? So that I didn't feel like I was totally alone when I was there and didn't know anybody. It kind of helps <clears throat> when you're able to take someone else with you. So, you know, that's one suggestion. Um, when you're meeting people, I, I try to always get their information, their contact information. Um, it's great to be able to say hi to someone, but to be able to say hi and get their information and then follow up with them later is going to be even better. And a lot of people don't follow up. So the more you can follow up, the more you'll stand apart from other people. Um, I try to, to um, stay in touch with my contacts because I never want it to be uh, where I haven't talked to them in three years and then I'm sending them an email like, hi, and A, they're not gonna remember who I am, or B, they're gonna be like, why is she contacting me? I haven't heard from her in forever. So I'm not saying that you have to, you know, email people once a month, but try to keep in contact with them at least once a year, if not just to say hi, or Merry Christmas, or whatever it may be, so that you kind of stay in people's minds. Um, networking is just as important for you when you have a job, when you don't have a job. Um, some people kind of sit down on networking when they have a job because they feel like they don't need to do it anymore. Well, you never know when your job's gonna have a layoff. You never know when you may get tired of your job and just want, want out. So you should always network regardless of your status, whether it be employed, unemployed, retired. You know, even once you retire, maybe you have kids or grandkids that may need work. So networking will always be important. So again, you know, we talked about this earlier about this elevator speech. That's why this elevator speech is so important because when you're networking, the first thing people are going to want to know is something about you. They want to know who you are, what you do. So you need to at least have that two to three minute speech prepared that you can speak to when you meet somebody. So um, networking, very important. I want to make sure you guys understand that. Um, when you're networking, you got to make sure you have a nice handshake. <laughs> no, try again. No, no, try again. No, try again. There you go. Nice firm handshake. Nice firm handshake. There you go. That's a good handshake. There you go. That's a good handshake. Good you learned that. Good <laughs> you gotta work on your own. <laughs> no, this, this is funny, but it's important because people will read you in the first five seconds when they shake your hand. They're gonna like you or they're not gonna like you. So you wanna make sure you have a nice firm handshake, whether regardless of gender. You don't wanna, you know, I think she shook my hand. I think it had I been a male, she might have shaken my hand differently. You wanna you wanna make sure your handshake is consistent regardless of who it is. And when you shake, you want to make sure you have good eye contact. Uh, when I shake your hand, you didn't, you look down. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure when you shake someone's hand, there you go. You look them in the eye so, so they know you mean business. There you go. But right, so this is important. This is important. There How about you go. if an Asian person? There you go. How about an Asian person? Well, you're right, because with different cultures, sometimes they do things easy. differently. And that's OK. That's their culture but you still want to look at them, okay. right? So the elevator speech, um, where will you do that at? Can you do just your, um, your workplace or? It can be anywhere because you don't know when you're going to meet somebody. I've met people at the gas station, in the grocery store, who turned out to be vice presidents. So you just turn and be like, hi, my name is so and so. <laughs> well, well, this is a good question. Okay, so obviously we know that it's going to happen in a, in a, at work, or if we're going to a meeting, we know it's gonna happen. But let's say you are at a grocery store, and you turn and you can't make eye contact with someone. You don't wanna just start talking to them. <laughs> what I'm saying is this, this happens after they prompt you. So okay. let's say you're in a grocery store, and um, you are just having you know, small talk with someone, you guys are talking about tomatoes. Well, if they don't say anything else, fine. But they may 
you know, sometimes people want to engage conversation with you. So they may say, you know, you know, what's your name? And then that's when you start. Mm -hmm. But if they don't, if you don't feel like they're engaging more conversation with you, then you, know, you don't want to just, <laughs> you only want to give that information if it's solicited. Mm -hmm. but, but the take home is that you need to be prepared because you never know who's going to ask you or, or when or where it may happen. It may happen at church. Maybe someone brings a visitor and this visitor might be a senator. You know, you just never know. So don't be prepared to say everywhere you go, <laughs> but you want to be prepared to have it in case someone asks for it. Yes, the guy who I met, yeah. he, uh, I told him there was a FTCC student and that I was at HMT program. And then I was almost done, but one of my classes wasn't available till next year. And he asked me which class it was. And then he's like, so it's not enough. A student was like, it's not even that. It's just because me, I didn't look my plan before I registered. And that, that was kind of my fault. And he said that, and then he apologized. But he said that he, that he hopes that I got a good experience at FDCC and blah, blah, blah. Man, can you believe I don't even remember his name? That's how, because I registered so many people. So yeah. you failed at networking. Yeah. If you don't remember anything else, you got to remember the name, at least the last name, right? Mm. At least until you get home, you can write it down. I know, but I mean, I probably if I see him, I will remember him. But. but back to your example very quickly, I think your elevator speech was pretty good, and, you, and again, you never know who you're going to meet, and by you mentioning that certain class doesn't offer, who knows what he might have been able to do, especially at his level. So again, you just never know who you're going to talk to, so you want to make sure your elevator speech is good and it covers everything you want a person to know. So in your case, if you met somebody, you should definitely be saying, hi, my name is Michelle, I'm in the HMT program, I'm graduating next month. There's key things you want to make sure that they know that may spark more conversation, or you know, if you mention that you're graduating, they may say, ah, you know, Maybe she's looking for work, or I have someone that's looking for someone. But if you were to just say, hi, my name is Michelle, I'm in the HMT program at FTCC, you know, it doesn't really. So you want to make sure your elevator speech, you cover specific things quickly, because again, you're not going to be in front of this person for a long time. That's why I said, that's why it's called an elevator speech, because you usually don't ride the elevator for that long. But you want to make sure you touch on the key things you want that person to know. In your case, if you know you, or looking for a particular job, or if um, it's a military person, but they don't know that you're military, you might say, hi, my name is Mary, I'm in the HMT program, I previously served in the, you know what I mean? So you wanna make sure that your elevator speech kind of caters to you, but by you saying that you were in the military, if they didn't know that you were in the military, but you know that they were in the military, they may have something in mind for you or in store for you or know someone else based on the fact that they found out that you were also in the military. Okay. So, um, all good questions. Any you other questions for us? <laughs> they should have a class on networking. You know how they have a class for public speaking? Yeah. They should have a class for networking. They should. I mean, it, it, <laughs> I didn't realize how important it was until after I got out of school. It's more nowadays than it used to be because it, it wasn't. It's all about who you know now compared to how it used to be. But everything now is based on who you know. I think it's always been important, but I think the key now is that the job market is so different, and so it's more. It is everywhere you it's, go. It's, it's more important you know. now because the competition is more fierce. There's more people looking for jobs because mm -hmm. of how the job the market economy is. is. Yeah. Um, steps to success. We kind of already touched on this, but I want to cover it because. You know, in other classes, we've kind of talked about organizations having a mission, vision, and values. Well, you should have those for yourself because those are going to be your steps to success. So you want to begin with the vision. As we have discussed in the past, the vision is forward-looking, futuristic. So you want to think about where you want to be. That's going to be your vision. You want to make a mission statement for yourself, just like we made one for organizations and classes, other classes, um, as well as goals. For each goal, you want to have a list of objectives, meaning for this goal, how will I get there? Those are going to be your objectives. Um, similar to our SWOT analysis, you want to take inventory of your strengths and weaknesses. Everybody knows what they're good at. Everybody knows what they're bad at. Face it. Don't try to run away from it because the more that you accept your strong points and your weak points, the more successful you will be. Because if you know that you're weak in coding, it would make no sense to get a coding job. 
So it's important to know what you're weak at and, and what you're strong at because that's going to help you be more successful. And prepare a needs analysis. Everybody know what a needs analysis is? It's basically going to be what your needs are. And uh, I want to come here because this deals with needs. If you don't take any other notes down, I want you to um, take notes on this. This is a diagram. It's called the Q5 framework. And what this diagram does is it pretty much it, it, uh, is an assessment of your personal needs as well as company needs. So there's five components. I hope you guys can see this. Here you have your individual needs, your individual offer, company needs, company offer, and in the middle is the plan. So I'm going to quickly go through this because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, but if I start here with individual needs, the questions you would ask here is what are my values and interests? Okay, what am I interested in? What types of things do I value? The second thing would be what do I need to do to keep my life in balance? So again, here we're considering family, personal, as well as career. Number three, what are my developmental needs? What do I need to develop myself to grow and progress? Um, <clears throat> this quadrant down here is individual offer. Here is where you will ask, what are my skills and talents? What can I offer in terms of skills and talents to an organization? How do I deliver value? And we each will de deliver value differently. Maybe your value is customer service. You're really good at it, and that's how you'll deliver value to the company. Maybe your value is numbers. Maybe you're really good at crunching numbers, and so your value will be cost savings to the organization. So everybody will have different things that they can deliver, but you need to determine what that is. And the last thing is, what is my competitive advantage? What that means is, what sets me apart from everybody else? Why, what can I offer to a company that someone else can't? So these are your offers, your individual offers. Over here, We'll start here. Company needs. So here you're asking, what are the goals and mission of my company or organization? What skill sets do I need to help my company? And what changes affect my company's needs? This one will be, obviously, we um, have Obamacare coming. We have uh, changes in reimbursements. Those are the type of things, increased competition. Those are the types of things that may affect your company's needs. And then up here we have company offer. What are the growth opportunities in my company? What benefits does my company offer? And what can my company offer to make me more effective? Now once you've asked and answered all of these questions, in the middle you have the plan. And the action plan is going to be what you use throughout your career. So, and you can use this Q5, Q5 framework if you're currently in a position. You can use it if you're currently in a position but looking to move somewhere, somewhere else. But basically these four quadrants are what help to um, put together the action plan as to what, what you're going to do. Does that make sense? I thought that, I, I, you know, I just learned about this, you know, um, earlier this year, and I was thinking, man, I wish I would have had this, you know, earlier on in my career because these are some really good questions that they ask, and it makes a lot of sense that you can't just think about your own individual needs. You have to also think about the company's needs and what they offer as well in order to have a really thorough action plan for your career. So it's called the Q5 framework. Um, and I think it's a really important career tool to use. You don't have it in your slides in the PowerPoint? Um, I will email it. Um, I'll email it to you guys. Um, so um, I wanted to for fast forward to that because we we're talking about needs. But the last thing I want to say about success is that you have to be motivated. The minute you lose your motivation, you think yeah. you will continue to be successful? Um, so you have to keep that will, that drive, that motivation because that's what's going to help you reach your goals. Um, 
succession plan we talked about a little bit earlier and why it's so important to also develop other people. Um, the stronger supervisors are going to be the ones that do a good job at succession planning. Um, the weaker supervisors are going to be the ones that have not developed anybody else to take their place um, once they leave. Um, your manager will have a lot of respect for you if you have done this. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to, <coughs> to um, ask you about something. I think it's wonderful about you to develop your personnel and also you talked before having someone to be able to take over your job. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people lose their job when they have someone else to take over their job. You, you see, that's why a lot of times they're kind of scared to... You mean, what you're saying is people have fear of someone coming yeah. in. Well, and that's a fair, a fair concern. But in my mind, I'm thinking um, you have to make sure you're doing these simultaneously. You don't want to be just complacent in your role and not growing and, and trying to develop someone else. You want to be making sure that you're setting yourself up to move up also while you're developing them. So what that means is if the position above you is, is filled, and there's no indication that that person is going anywhere, then this is not as much of a priority. If you have a feeling that that position is about to be open or it's open already, this is a priority because you want to move up. So sure, you don't want to you know, have someone take over, but at the same time, you have to think about yourself. If somebody's able to take your job, then what are you doing? So, but, but that's a valid concern. And, and going back to what I said earlier, I think that is probably one of the reasons why people don't do this. And that coupled with the fact that people are just selfish and they don't care about the growth of anybody else but themselves. Um, so yes, good question or comment. Anybody else? Um, or the other thing is, if you're looking outside, it doesn't matter if they take your spot. If you're looking to um, move to a different organization and get a job there, then sure, why not? Um, again, it's gonna be an easier transition for you out of the organization if you have someone to fill your um, role versus if you just leave and say bye. Because you have to remember, it all goes back to networking. If you leave one organization on a bad note, mm -hmm. who knows who they may know down the road that may come back and bite you. Yeah. So I think it's important nonetheless. And that's it. Let's go back to this, because um, we're going to be talking about this a little bit on Thursday. So I want to make sure you guys don't have any questions about this framework. Because you guys already know what's going to happen, right? <laughs> Do one. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So, so any questions about this? No? All right, we're done. We're done, we're done, we're done. I got a question about the case study we did. The last question you answered, I couldn't answer that question. My husband said that whatever I could, it was wrong. 